what's going to happen to you next. Uh, this will be part lecture, if you will, and part workshop. Um, so I reckon we'll just be comfortable at first. Um, maybe if you want, you can sit on the stairs. Uh, we can do it on the grass as well. I don't care. And um, we'll look into a bit of the the life of Camilo Agrippa and the historical setting he acted in and uh, where his ideas originated and, and all that. And then uh, we'll just dabble with his premises, so to say, um, and look into what's actually worth uh, taking into consideration and what might be um, rightfully uh, have been criticized later on because hardly any masters that came after him uh, didn't in some way uh, hate on him. <laughs> and still they used lots of what he uh, invented. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, maybe uh, settle onto the stairs there. Less ants, less bugs and... Do we need a jacket after? Uh, after you might, uh, we'll stab at each other, okay. but uh, it'll be a low intensity thing. <clears throat> okay, so as has been uh, said, <laughs> it's, it's a bit like t teaching a class. <laughs> okay, lovely. As has been said, uh, this will be about Camilo Agrippa, basically. And it, when the question came up whether I wanted to teach a workshop on this event. Uh, Stefan and I brainstormed a little bit uh, what could be the content. And um, we had this little chat about last year's workshop by Lynette Nussbacher, uh, who called our workshop, There Was No Renaissance. I don't know if any of you saw that one. Maybe yes. Um, her case was basically the fighting or the way you would position your, yourself in a, in a sword fight uh, concerning your life being threatened and everything um, did not change uh, anything than gradually over time. So the, if, if I got correctly what she was trying to say, um, there wasn't a renaissance in the way of uh, people used to fence like this in like more ancient times, and then there was a certain point of realization, if you will, and at that point people switched and, and did something else. But rather than that, uh, we have a certain evolution of, of fighting, um, and depending on weapon and, and system, people always would fall back into the same habits and the same behaviors and, and positions and everything. Um, so this workshop, uh, is called There Was Indeed a Renaissance. So I'm trying to make the contra case, if you will, uh, but not looking into the fighting movement and posture or anything, uh, but rather into the didactics, which, to my mind, changed dramatically when uh, Camilo Agrippa released his book in 1553. Okay. So that being the introduction, my name is Adrian. I'm from Lüneburg, which is close to Hamburg, uh, North Germany. Uh, my club there turns 10 years this year. So uh, we'll have a little celebration in November. And um, some of you know me. I know some of you, some of you don't. Um, if you want to ask, like critical questions, feel free to do so. I don't claim to this being a complete insight into Camilla, uh, Camilo Agrippa. Uh, I don't claim uh, to like speak the truth about his intentions or his ideas. Um, this workshop is focused <clears throat> or is based on Ken Monshine's interpretation of his uh, Italian original treatise and uh, I basically grabbed the ideas that Ken Monshine uh, discusses 
uh, and made them into a workshop for you today so it's not um, like a, a, a complete thing, right? And if you want to criticize or, or have different ideas, have maybe read different interpretations that's open to discussion, uh, but please do it in a way that doesn't kill the structure of the workshop. So maybe uh, we'll find a point towards the end of the workshop where we can uh, discuss ideas that may differ. Okay, any questions so far? Yes, one. When we ask you a question, would you repeat it for the mic? Oh yeah, I'll try to, to keep that in mind. So uh, your question was, could I repeat the question? Um, I'll, I'll try to keep that in mind. And if I don't, uh, yeah, don't hesitate to, to call, call me here. All right, so Camilo Agrippa, um, he was a science guy, if you will. He said he uh, went into Rome sometime uh, in the 1530s and he published his book in uh, 1553. He passed away just short of the 17th century. Uh, he died in 1598. And um, his book was printed several times over well into the 17th century as well. It was a book that got lots of recognition. People were impressed by, by what he had published. And uh, still, there's hardly any source after Agrippa that doesn't in one way uh, use what he what he brought into the fencing world in a way uh, but also criticize them a lot and um, there's good reason for that because the way he proposes his ideas on fencing is basically uh, I'm showing you the science of it and now that you've seen the science you know it must be true so this is how it works, okay? And we'll get to uh, different examples for that. So basically, he, he was an architect, uh, a mathematician, and he looked into fencing, trying to find the geometrical and uh, logical uh, foundations. And what he didn't do, uh, like the earlier masters, um, was give, that's basically the point of this workshop to, to realize, uh, the, the older sources we have basically teach by giving the ideal example of a certain bout, right? Uh, if you look into, I don't know, the Valpurgis or several Lichtenauer tradition books, it's always the same principle of teaching, which is I give you the ideal example of how it goes, and from doing that, uh, you should learn to realize the, the, um, the rules below this, uh, the, the basis rules that are hidden in, in, in that. Is that clear? Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so Agrippa just goes into certain like single action moments and gives you the, the best angle, the best line, the best way of uh, replying to something, and uh, then shows you by several examples that it works. And that's basically his, his, uh, his method. Uh, he gives you the, the example for, maybe uh, he, he talks about his first guard, I'll get into that in a moment, and, and then shows why his way of performing the first guard is better than anyone else's. And uh, talking about the first guard, he's considered to be the first um, of giving the basic guards numbers instead of fancy names. And uh, all the later Italian uh, rapier sources basically adopted that. So calling the first guard or prima uh, the first because it's like the first position when you draw your sword and from that rotating into second into third and into fourth was basically um, yeah the foundation of this more modern approach to teaching fencing and uh, many many uh, fencing masters in later centuries adopted that uh, there's some 
you, you can tell he's he's new to it, and and he's kind of uh, he found something there, but it's not quite uh, come to perfection, if you will, because uh, he just goes on and on and on, numbering, or he he gives uh, the guards letters then in in the uh, uh, the drawings. And he just goes on with his examples, and every new example gets a new letter. So uh, you have the first four principal guards, and they're first, second, uh, third, and fourth, and they're also A, B, C, and D, and then it goes on. And uh, you have E, and F, and G, and H, and there's not really uh, um, a solid logic to why uh, D, so a fourth guard in, no, in, in wide stance is D, but a fourth guard in narrow stance is H. Is there? It's just his way of counting through the different examples and you gotta, uh, you gotta learn uh, which is what. And I'm not going to bore you with that today because I found it a little bit, um, of a grind to just, you know, uh, memorize uh, if, I, if I call an I guard, well, which was that again, okay? So we'll basically uh, assume what he uh, talks about a lot, that there's a narrow stance and there's a wide stance, we'll get into that, for every, uh, for each of the four guards. And um, there's combinations obviously, but uh, basically that's, that's his whole uh, idea. You, you, you boil it down to this basic rule of there being four guards and two different ways of standing. And uh, from that you can basically work everything that he's trying to tell you. And uh, what we'll mostly look into today is his idea of voiding the opponent's blade, uh, of disengaging pressure on the blade, and of basically going contra tempo all the time. Uh, he's uh, mostly focused on your sword and your sword hand should be <coughs> towards the opponent as much as possible. Uh, you should not withdraw your arm, you should not fall into short poses and guards, you should always be in a long position and threaten them with your point. And if you can't slash them across the neck or wrist or something, but it's basically always point into the enemy. And that's another thing that uh, got adopted by lots of Italian uh, masters after that. Um, and especially if you look into modern fencing uh, and modern epee and, and um, foil fencing, you have these two greater traditions of French and Italian school, and the Italian school is totally focused around always keeping the point on the targets. Okay, so even today that has some, some impact. And even today in modern fencing, they still use the same uh, numbering system for the basic guards, only hardly anyone does a second anymore, right? But it's still there, it's still uh, numbered the same way, it's still, uh, the idea is still the same. So um, the point I'm trying to make, there was a renaissance, in fencing, but it wasn't so much about the fighting mechanics uh, just slowly evolving naturally instead of a breaking point that turned one thing into another, uh, but the idea on how to approach teaching fencing to someone who would actually be able to learn it from the book. Um, Joachim Meyer did that for, for Germany, right? Uh, we have uh, in, in the German set of treaties, we have basically the obscure Lichtenauer tradition and variations of said giving a perfect example and learning from that. And then we have uh, Meyer who tries and uh, looking at the timeline, he's not that far away from the book that uh, Camilo Agrippa published. Um, who tries first in, in this German uh, line of fencing masters, uh, tries to give you a book that you can actually learn from. 
it's not always that well made. It's not always that easily uh, learned from, yeah, because he does those loops and hoops and you gotta gotta think yourself into the way he tries to 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 make this work, but it's there. It's it's um, the the purpose of the book is actually teaching you fencing and not just uh, a collection of reminders of things that you would probably have been taught by someone and then uh, are given the the text afterwards to to memorize it. Questions so far. So, yeah, please. Um, Vigiani wrote his Oscaramos about Mickey Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. Vigiani right. wrote his Oscaramos in about 1550 and 1551. It wasn't published until 1575. And he numbers his guards differently from the way a griffler does. Right. Do you think that a griffler was in any way aware of Vigiani? I'm pretty sure. Um, so, again, I didn't work myself into the history of Italian fencing masters that deeply. Uh, I basically, uh, I, I based this workshop on uh, the writings of Ken Monshine, and he has this huge uh, chapter uh, of forewords and everything. Uh, all right, and, and it, I think it's basically all in there. There, there were all those uh, connections and, and rivalries and people trying to, to publish something new and something, uh, yeah, especially uh, groundbreaking, if you will. Um, so I, I reckon he would have been aware of, of what was happening there. Yeah. Any, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> good call, good call. So the question I just replied to was, uh, would uh, Camilo Agrippa have been aware of, uh, was it Vigiani, uh, writing another book with different system of numbering the guards? All right. Okay, anything else? So the... The core idea, there was a renaissance in teaching or in, in the approach to teaching fencing by giving it a systematic um, like overview of the rules that apply to how you should do your fencing instead of giving you examples and uh, having you learn from those. And we'll try to uh, go into the practical part now, uh, try to see if the teachings that Agrippa wrote down work from our uh, perspective today. Because back then, it, it appears to have been a really groundbreaking release. People were impressed by, by the ideas and uh, really were, um, they were like, he's onto something there. That's, that's, that's so... Uh, narrowed down to what is really important uh, and that, that's so new it must have been something of a breakthrough uh, for lots of fences uh, in a setting that was in in the italy of of, of those days uh, was a setting where suddenly military um, power and uh, armed combat was no longer like a privilege of, of, the, of the upper class, but like the normal guy could just pick up a sword and be someone of importance if he knew how to, how to fence well. Um, and Agrippa always goes into uh, the, the duel as well as the battlefield. He's, he's pretty certain that his, uh, his principles apply to, to all of those scenarios. And he's always about life-threatening scenarios. It's not, it's not a sport to him. It's more like we have a society that uh, encourages men, basically, to be good dualists and by that claim societal status and, and, uh, and power, in a way. Uh, because uh, suddenly, yeah, as I said, uh, like the, the normal guy, uh, he didn't have to be a knight or anything anymore. It does, didn't have to be a, a huge privileged tournament thing. You just had to be good uh, with a so sword. You didn't have to, uh, to have a horse or a, an armor and all those. Uh, you just had to be a good fencer and suddenly people would take notice and, and uh, you, you could make a living of that. And uh, that time, or rather the book in that time, 
must have strung a chord with uh, with lots of people. They they recognize it, right? And now, from our perspective today, uh, I think it's a little different because uh, we know the later teachings, and we know the, the <laughs> there's this movie thing in Princess Bride, right? Uh, if you've studied your Agrippa, but I find Capoferro cancelled out, right? He does. <laughs> he does, yeah. Uh, so knowing how to cancel out uh, Agrippa's ideas, it might be a little uh, quirky uh, doing what we want to do now. Uh, but I, I invite you to just, you know, go and try it out, even if it's weird, and uh, see what works for you, and maybe see the, the novelty of it uh, if you try to, to imagine yourself back into a time uh, that didn't have this kind of teaching before, okay? Right, so uh, if you need any gear, um, you might want a breastplate, but I think it, it is a low intensity thing, right? We're basically dabbling around with his principal ideas, so a mask should be, uh, should be the minimum. Uh, apart from that, you need a rapier-ish sword. Uh, what we see in Agrippa's uh, illustrations is basically like this, right? It's basically a side sword with a longish blade and um, everything that, that works in this regard is, is fine, okay? It doesn't have to be an overly long crazy rapier. Uh, it just, just yeah, just, just a sword basically, okay? Any questions? Well, gear up and uh, we'll meet on the on the green for example in general in general all right so, general so all the question the question or, or the the remark is uh, there's certain ideas that kind of fly around yes, and they emerge, uh, they emerge, tend to emerge in different places at the same time yeah different uh, different people pick the them up and yeah right yeah i think so, um I mean, the point I'm making or trying to make in this workshop that the the renaissance happening uh, in the approach to to uh, didactical uh, fencing or, or fencing teachings, um, I think that's exactly uh, happening uh, exactly there, right? The idea of we we suddenly have more insight into uh, scientific methods, um, mathematics, geometrical knowledge, and everything. I mean. Earlier, uh, earlier sources use geometry as as uh, reference reference points, right? That's not an entirely new idea, but the 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 way of approaching it with just that, uh, with just logic, with just science, that's something new, and and that's obviously not something only Agrippa found, uh, but that's part of the zeitgeist, if you will, and uh, I think, yes, there, there would have been more people approaching the same ideas in, the, in a similar way, yeah. Okay, so, first things first, the guards. Like Agrippa says, if you draw your sword, and he recommends a narrow stance, uh, then you draw and you'll find yourself in first guard, or A, right? And um, then there's a long discussion on why you should move that forward towards your opponent as much as possible. And uh, funny thing, if you if you know the the workshop that Linus, uh, Linette Nussbacher did last year about Fabris, um, who was like all about covering behind the sword hilt and and protecting the head or the face with your arm and then having the rib cage. Uh, show away from the opponent's blade and everything. Um, that, that, there's lots of similarities there, while at the same time Agrippa is super lazy, right? Apart from just extending the arm all the time, he's super lazy about moving the body and is basically like that. Uh, in the illustrations uh, all his guys are like super uh, high on their, on their feet and, and uh, their knees rather straight and everything. So first guard with a narrow stance, that's where we'll start. And um, from there we go into second guard, which is, which is still in a narrow stance, which is that. Um, you can open it up like this, so if you, if you want to invite the attack of something, then uh, he shows us something like this, uh, but mostly it's still 
keep your point forward towards the opponent as much as possible. And then if you go into a wider stance and you drop your sword on top of your knee, uh, then that's the third. Uh, why he does a wider stance in his primary third position, I didn't quite get, <laughs> to be honest, um, because then there's uh, 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 later points in the in the treatise. There's uh, as well this position, and I reckon it's a. This should be three. Pardon? Yeah. It's, it's still it's still, yeah. still a third guard, but in a narrow stance, and he calls uh, uh, he calls that a narrow third or letter G, I reckon. Uh, anyway, that's why what, what I what I was talking about earlier. It's a bit um, you gotta wrap your your mind around this. Uh, numbers and letters thing. I don't think it's so important uh, because the, what we're trying to, to look at is, uh, is not afflicted by it. So third guard and from that we go into fourth and we'll use the fourth in different uh, stances quite a lot because it's uh, the second and fourth obviously are like the defensive guards if you will. And uh, like I mentioned earlier he basically seeks the contratempo, or in, in uh, German, the Lichtenauer Sprech, uh, the absetzen and the indes all the time. It's basically, he does this or that, you stab him. And uh, there's different ways of stabbing him, and we look into some uh, rather exotic ones and some uh, rather, like, not so surprising varieties, uh, but you'll see what I mean in a moment. Okay. The first uh, thing that I found pretty intriguing was his idea of creating reach. Uh, because uh, his being lazy, uh, he doesn't do overly long lunges. He doesn't really uh, like step into the fight because he's always about, no, you gotta control what the other one does and then move in contra tempo. Um, so he goes about angles and lines and uh, his observations are that if you increase the sharpness of this angle between your upper body and, and your upper leg, so the hip angle, uh, the more reach you will generate, which is kind of obvious, right? And then uh, if you push your knee further forward, you still will generate more reach. This, in, in modern standards, is not uh, what is taught today, right? People are always about avoiding to overly extend the knee across the foot, but uh, Agrippa argues that the shoulder should always be above the knee to keep your structure stable. And uh, if you find a spot on the green where you can just experiment a little. Uh, do you need to limber up, warm up a, a bit? No? All right. Uh, the first thing we'll want to try is just basically from narrow stance in first, we do a half step. So let's say my uh, foot goes there not an entire length of my foot further. This is what he calls a medium step. And from that, I extend the arm and the shoulder and I increase these two angles like this, right? And that's basically all we're doing. And he says, doing that, we can uh, get at least three palmas of reach. A palma is, uh, in German it's called a spanne, is this, uh, this length between your thumb and, and the pinky finger. So if you, uh, if you were to measure three palmas on your blade, that's about the amount of reach that you can get from, from this move, is what he, what he says. And I found it quite intriguing to realize that you can probably reach even a little more without stepping into that further, without lunging or anything, uh, if you will. Um, 
if I stay like this, I oh know I just need your sword as a marker in a moment. Okay. If, uh, if I position myself like this and you find my point now and just uh, put up your blade like this to, to measure my reach, okay? And um, this is where I start. And now I step into that uh, medium stance and then increase my length, my reach like this. Then you realize that's the length I, I gained, right? And if I measure that, it's one, two, three, and even a little more. And uh, as obvious as it might seem at first, I find that quite intriguing uh, to, to make it a principal thing in your approach to fencing, right? To, to just voiding and, and playing with the opponent until you can at some point, uh, maybe if you push against my blade to, exactly, uh, I will disengage and then just go in like this, right? And that's basically all he does. He looks for these kind of openings, like, like disengagements and, and voidings and everything. And then he goes in and stabs the other guy. And that's basically all he is about, okay? So we'll look into uh, different variations. First, I want you to try how much reach you can get by that move. So from the narrow stance, and if you do it in seconda or in prima, that doesn't really matter, right? If, if you extend your arm into the maximum position, you barely, in seconda, you barely get like half a, a palm's length in addition, okay? To start with, not in your final reach, okay? Uh, so you might have your point a little further towards the opponent initially, but I don't know if you actually gain more reach as well. You can try that. Uh, so you find someone to just mark your starting point and then try to create as much reach as you can by just stepping into it like half step and then over extending the knee and the upper body into this uh, long reach stab. Okay, go ahead, have fun. So your question being, how much time does it take to perform either, uh, like we would say today, regular lunge, or this Agrippa lunge alternative uh, to actually reach the target, right? I think since we don't do this today, or rarely do this today, it'll get, it'll take some getting used to. Um, but if you consider the knee as a supporting structure of, of your shoulder, um, in, in that regard, uh, that it should always be under your shoulder to help you recover from that, then you realize all you have to do basically from this position is stand up, right? Just straighten the leg again. And uh, that's mighty different uh, to a normal lunge because in a lunge, it's a question of athletics, right? You have to be rather athletic to perform a long lunge and recover from that without any hustle, yeah? And often it's not a question about the the time into the target, but about recovery, right? Do you agree? A lot of times I can easily hit the target, but I don't recover quickly enough to protect myself against the afterblow or something. So, do you do a lunge that deep? Because by the rapier, if I'm coming limping, fencing, okay, I do something like this. Well, but I, I think I don't do this with this kind of weapon. Okay, so the question, yeah. A lunge more like a very, like a short and very sharp step. All right, so your, your question being, um, do I actually use long lunges like that in rapier at all? And I think, Not at all, but that all right, I think that heavily depends on uh, what sources you're basing your, your fencing on. Yes. And if you look into, um, Fabrice, for example, the, the answer might be entirely different uh, than if you're looking into, I don't know, Destessa or, or whatever. Um, and uh, Capoferro, for example, up until today is the prime example for a long lunge. Uh, he has this plate 
uh, of a fencer uh, lunging like a really long uh, distance and it's still in modern fencing um, books right fencing for beginners uh, there's books of all, all sorts and colors uh, concerning that topic and most of them at somewhere have this picture of, of Capo Ferro's uh, naked guy doing this overlong um, like the perfect lunge so I think it, it totally depends on where we look right right um, just stay high when you can't do it and get the cover from it just avoid it yeah if you're good enough do it otherwise <laughs> stay so uh, your input is maya uh, suggests stay high unless you're fit enough to do a long lunge but if you if we look uh, uh, especially into maya's plates uh, then we see lots of really long stances right so the the ideal uh, of good fencing uh, be it longsword or rapier or whatever, is actually a quite long uh, reach, right? In in performing lunge e uh, stances, right? Your question? Uh, and, uh, if I remember it right, uh, in Capofero, when he describes the lunge, uh, just one foot, right? Just one length of the foot. Okay. Oh, that's interesting because it kind of uh, attaches to what Agrippa does, yeah. but in the way that he actually does lunge if you will and not only from this half step push forward right so it, it kind of could be an evolving next step okay yeah well interesting so he doesn't actually push that that much into it yeah uh, the input uh, sorry the, the input was that uh, capoferro's description of that plate is actually uh, you just advance one foot length into that lunge okay anything else Right, so let's look into the superiority of Agrippa's fencing uh, compared to all the other masters earlier, right? That's what he always argues. Okay, uh, if you position, and then again, it's not Stücke, right? It's not entire uh, pieces of Zufechten and, and all that. It's just a principle uh, observation of what could happen if I'm in a narrow first, what could they try? And then find something uh, yeah, according to, to the principle of contra tempo that uh, breaks this attack. And we'll start easily. Uh, we already had the example, I'm in narrow first and my opponent will try to beat my blade aside. Exactly, right? Uh, it's a standard move, obviously. He'll probably uh, try to maybe cut uh, to my waist or stab or whatever um, by beating the blade aside. It's, it's a absolute, um, an absolute standard, right? Uh, later on, he does the same uh, with the opponent having a dagger or a, a glove or a gauntlet or something and uh, beating the, the blade aside with the secondary weapon. Um, but basically, will perform sort of the same things, okay? So first thing, he'll try to beat my blade aside and instead, instead of allowing that, I will, try it again, I will disengage and stab him. Oh, no, no I, I did lunch, did you see that? <laughs> uh, not a, not a um, Camilo Agrippa fencer here. So disengage and basically just stab the guy, okay? And if you wanna be extra secure about his recovery, uh, you twist your wrist from first guard into second by by stabbing and reaching uh, so if he tries to recover from that and, and do anything like whatever uh, you already have your strong uh, true edge towards his blade so he doesn't have a, a good bind against yours okay so if he we can already uh, i think we can already put something up onto that because it's that simple um, if the strike comes in terza so from the inside um, uh, from from the inside now uh, i will basically again uh, disengage and now twist my hand into quart because that's where his blade is and then reach and stab him okay that simple you see that's the science of it it works do it <laughs> okay does it matter if i 
uh, we at the point that I tend to prefer in this direction. Uh, uh, so in this direction, I tend to do this. Okay. Side, well, on the other, from the other side, does it, does it matter? Um, so the question is about twisting the right. wrist into one or the other um, guard, right? Agrippa, being the logically thinking man he is. It's all science, right? Uh, argues with false edge is weaker than the true edge, uh, strong against weak, and all those points, we know that. And he tries to always position the true edge to where we expect the next bind to happen. So if I disengage, and by disengaging give you my false edge, I weaken myself unnecessarily, and therefore rotate into second, so I can with. Uh, he's, he says it's, it's a forte in the way of I force myself into into the bind that I can expect to happen. Right? Anything else? How did that work? Uh, two things. Yeah. Uh, one is you have to do it at a distance where you can actually hit them. Right. Right. So, can I poke you him in the face for? <laughs> Uh, what, uh, would you would you come in, into yeah, 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 yeah. the uh, angle of the camera so uh, so we can someone to poke. yeah please all right so if we do it in reverse right do so your worst I'm all lean forward <laughs> yeah very far I have to be here but I have to I'm not gonna do it now because right. right you have to it still to put bent, some right? more okay. pressure into so it this right? is the position from which you should start because otherwise you can't hit yeah good point right. so if you if we want to try a good measure for practicing yeah. this exercise, you need to have like the ideal measure that you have. So when, if your yeah. blade doesn't bend when you hit the other person, you're not dangerous and it doesn't yeah. matter. Well, yeah. So, that is one thing. Uh, and from here we find it quite difficult to actually disengage because the blades are so close. Right. So if I try and beat on your blade. Yeah. Yeah. He actually doesn't actually wait for the bind. Uh, he just disengages before anything can happen. So if I try and beat on your blade, right. you'll disengage before and then... You. Yeah, I see. <laughs> so I can disengage there, but if yeah. I get closer where I can actually hit you, I if, can't do it in time. If necessary, you always have a step that you can go and, and uh, yeah. lengthen your thrust. And the, the other thing... So he, he's not forbidding... That. He's not forbidding to actually step in. Mm. Um, and if need... Sure. Right? And if need be, uh, from... the like I said, it's basically the principal idea of this working, right? The principal idea of generating reach by bending here and pushing the knee forward. And if you're not in reach, then you need to step into reach, okay? Yeah. And uh, I think that's kind of the problem with this book, uh, as well as the novelty, that you don't discuss actual... Um, uh, Stücke, right? Actual pieces of he does this, you do that, and, and, and then you get to somewhere. But it's basically just you have this, this one little observation, and how and, and when you work yourself into that, that's up to you. Yeah. Okay? Because I'm giving you the rules, yeah. now you know the rules, you should know how to fence. So, to that thing, <laughs> the other thing is just the order in which you do it, right? Because there's right. two components one is the leaning, and one is the putting the knee over the face. Yeah. And I found that if you do the knee first and then the leaning is right. more balanced because you can throw too much weight forward too quickly here that you kind of can't yeah, recover yeah. from it easily. Good point. So it's even better if you take a little extra step and then lean and then do the rest. Um, I'm not sure uh, if if we were to go into the uh, his text if we would actually find anything about that. Um, out of my uh, memorization I, I don't. Um, all he gives us is basically the demonstration of sharpening this angle and pushing that angle gives you reach. Yeah. Um, I think. Weakness of drawings, right? Yeah. There is an order to things, but yeah. you can't obviously draw everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's there? He has kind of a, he, he draws two radiuses, one for the knee and one for the um, reach of the arm and numbers them, or <clears throat> gives them letters again, A, B, C, D. So, uh, this is A, or let's say in a medium stance, this is A, and the, the angle 
for the hand corresponds to the angle for the knee and this is B and this is C. So we can, in a way, uh, argue that it's a simultaneous uh, thing because the angle for the knee is uh, in correspondence yeah. to the position of the arm uh, in that phase of the action. But I uh, let's let's not delve into that too much. I think it's uh, it's good input. I think if you want to train it and and actually do it, uh, you have to bear in mind. Does that work in, in this order or do I have to focus more on pushing forward first and giving like the second priority to, to bending the, the upper body? Um, good point. Anything? Okay. So <clears throat> we have all sorts of different disengagements from all four guards. Okay. Uh, for example, we work from first guard now we can do basically the same drill from second and even fourth, uh, while in second he um, suggests still staying in a narrow stance. In fourth he would rather have a wider stance to start with. Again, why that is, I can't really, <laughs> I can't really get a hold on. Uh, I think giving the uh, va like variant opportunities of even in fourth, you can have a narrow stance, and even in, in first, you can have a wide stance and everything. Uh, it's not so much about this should always be the case, but rather when you come into a guard like that, you'll probably normally stand in a wider position, right? As we uh, saw earlier, if I want to, uh, if you try to beat from the inside, uh, from the inside, and I, and I disengage, and then give you my fourth guard, then it'll probably a uh, scenario rather like this than like that, right? So basically, um, I think that's, that's how we can work with it. But we can do the, the same uh, principal thing. He tries to, to beat on my blade and I disengage, right? Yeah, and I, and I stab in and, and, and thrust. And the same works for, for fourth as well. Obviously, I can just stay in force, disengage, and, and thrust him. So there's that. Any questions concerning that? I mean, it's pretty logical, right? Uh, there's not much to it. It's science. It's science, right. So uh, one could argue that first guard, especially when I'm narrow in stance and have my hand reaching like towards the opponent, um, is weak against, for example, thrusts through the bind. If I stay, stand here and he tries to, exactly, he tries to cross over my blade and uh, with a bind approach me, then what should you do C considering this scientific approach? Disengage, Disengage exactly. And uh, we still have the problem of this blade. Uh, what do we do about that? So if I disengage like this, we will death. death. <laughs> yeah. So one one thing is overreaching. If he if he tries to strike low, then I overreach. So if he tries to go for my lower targets, then I overreach like this. And if you find this suicidal, I agree. And uh, <laughs> he has a reply to that by you can always beat the blade aside with your hand or dagger or whichever uh, you have, okay? And then you can evade the opponent's blade by um, this, like finding a new position for your body. And that's a huge thing uh, we'll work a lot with, right? Work with a lot. So he tries that. I step back here while disengaging and thrust the guy. And if I want to be extra secure, I twist my wrist into fourth guard while doing this, hop, and then uh, I'm all set, okay? Now I grabbed onto it, it's better to, to just give it a slap, uh, but basically that's all there is. You set your left foot back and find a position where you evade the original attack. You can give it a slap as well, and by positioning yourself in fourth, uh, you put yourself, uh, you put your sword between yourself and his. Uh, if he thrusts low, um, then, like I said, 
we can basically just overreach. And if he thrusts high, uh, then we have the, the sword as the secondary security measure in between his and my body. Questions? So I suggest to uh, get this to work, not just trying it out of the blue, but giving it a little structure. First, I'll forget about my blade. You'll stab onto my uh, preferred opening, exactly, and I just dis, uh, like evade the blade and, and uh, find a position where you can't strike me, right? So if I'm here and you find a good measure of uh, actually thrusting me, and you in initialize the attack, and I go here, that's basically what we'll do, okay? Uh, if that works, then I add my uh, left hand or secondary hand and try and give you a blade a stab so uh, or a slap so I uh, Void the attack and slap on the blade if you have a dagger It basically works the same So your dagger or gauntlet or cloak or he always goes on like yeah if you have a dagger or a gauntlet or a cloak or a shield that's basically the same only it isn't because a cloak and a shield guard the entire body but that'll be discussed elsewhere uh, but it's basically the same okay so uh, what we'll do is I wait for your attack I dislocate the uh, target and give your blade a slap and once we have that uh, we can obviously uh, work with the entire thing. You try bind over my blade, and now I can combine this, disengage, and uh, thrust you in the chest or face. Any questions? Give it a try. Okay, uh, if you don't mind, come a little, little closer so uh, we don't have to strain our voices that much. Question. Uh, yes, because uh, we were just discussing the use of the dagger, right? Um, and you have two extremes if you you can use the dagger. Right. If you have a deflecting movement like this, then you have basically the minimum amount of time of the uh, blade crossing the attack. Right. The opposite where. No one. Yeah. I think no one can get it. 100% of time uh, right. from my defense on the attack of line. So does he says anything where and how, or, or in which direction you um, move your second defense? Is more um, just a wide swiping or more forward or backward? So your your question is about how do I move the dagger? Uh, in proportion to the attack to get optimum results. Is yes, that, yeah? Basically the, the angle in which I... Sh in, in, in which uh, three-dimensional plane... Right, in, in which I should uh, move my dagger yes. like circular movement. So the second half of, of Agrippa's book covers lots of different um, scenarios with daggers, with uh, two swords uh, and, and such. And um, I invite you to uh, look it up. Because again, we have just these momentarily observations of, okay, if you have this setup, then this is what works. Uh, in this first part, he only mentions the dagger as an option. And he always just says slap onto the opponent, or the, the translation says slap. So I think it's a beat uh, in the way uh, onto the blade. Uh, evade and slap onto the blade. I reckon um, if without a dagger it's a slapping motion like this, it's basically like a downward cut. And I think uh, from the logic of how he interprets lines and angles uh, at, a, as, at the, the optimum um, proportion, he'll use it cutting wise because that's always focused on going into the target as soon as possible and with as much reach as possible. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Anything else? Okay, so how did you find um, this evasive movement? Is it something you know from different uh, sources? Is it something familiar? Yes? Do you know how it's called in later 
books. It's a traverse step, right? The traverse step just uh, like takes the center line of the fight. And if you traverse off that line, so if you step sideways off that line, then it's a traverse step and we'll see more of that. Uh, but there's a certain name for this figure landing a hit in quarta in fourth guard while traversing with the rear foot off the line and it's called the incartata right uh, so sorry come again the incartata, incartata. Uh, and that basically is what we just did uh, and uh, capofero and uh, well all those names um, most of them have some variation of of these kinds of movement and you basically you'll always find something that looks somewhere like that and what's interesting in so i i aim for a contra tempo strike against the opponent's attack so in their attack tempo i thrust to their opening by stepping off the attack line by probably defending myself with a secondary weapon or slapping them away or something and always having the hilt in a position that'll guard me against their blade returning into my direction. And uh, later that's called incartata, but I didn't find that word in Agrippa. Maybe it'll show up later in the book, but I don't think so. So I think the, the name for that move is a later invention, but the move definitely uh, basically originates there, okay? Sometimes it's called uh, girata, which right. means turn. Sometimes uh, Capofero calls it scanso de la vita, basically a void of the body. Right, okay. So there are different terms of this technique. Yeah, it, it's basically, uh, it's one of the principal ideas that really made their way into Italian fencing after what Agrippa published. And that's part of what I was trying to, uh, to um, yeah, put into words for this workshop. Okay, uh, there's a different variant of traversing and contra tempo thrusting into the opponent's attack. And that's uh, by traversing with the front foot across here. And uh, funny thing about Agrippa is that in his plates we see lots of um, like final positions in which his head is turned away. And the argument uh, by Ken Monshine is that uh, this being an age without a fencing mask or any protection and the fights, especially the dueling fights, uh, mostly happening uh, a la camisa, which is in a shirt, um, you have no protection against uh, superficial cuts. And Agrippa says you must always be ready to receive superficial wounds in return for killing him. Uh, he doesn't, you know, there's, there's fencing masters that go about, if you get scratched, that's bad, okay? Uh, but in that regard, Camillo Agrippa is a true Italian. He's like, yeah, well, if I receive a bleeding wound to the back of my head and he's dead, what's the deal, okay? And um, so what we see a lot is basically uh, turning away while stabbing the other guy. And I recommend you try that, if you want to, in a really safe setting. If you play with masks and protectors and you just want to, um, so especially the guy you're trying to stab in tempo uh, wears a mask and protectors and you try to, to just basically recreate the whole idea of, of this turning away and, and by turning away the face, voiding all the channel-like structures in front of the head, um, by that you'll see there's no controlling this contra-tempo moment, right? The setup must be right, but if it is, it works uh, miraculously um, without you even looking for it, okay? Without you even checking your success, it's just the point is there and he dies, okay? Uh, but in a less controlled scenario, and if you fence with people you don't know that well and everything, um, Please don't look uh, at where you're stabbing so there are no accidents, okay? And keep in mind what would actually happen. I, I don't go like, like that, but I'd actually go like this, okay? Covering my neck 
and uh, protecting my head or the, the front side of my head by turning it away while thrusting into his temple. What okay. The, yeah, please. What is the step after that one? Um, basically, what you can do, uh, we'll look into what actually happens uh, with his blade, okay? But what you can do, uh, you'll have his blade crossing into the empty space be, uh, on top of your arm here. And uh, what you can do, if that doesn't work for some reason, um, obviously disengage and return to a prima under his arm, okay? So what will happen is this. Uh, you volunteer again. Um, so if he, for some reason, tries to, let's say, bind in second and thrust me to the neck, to my head, to anything, right? So he'll want to come in here. Then what I do is I avoid this by stepping off and I disengage into that okay looks crazy does it yeah uh, that's what i mean in principle again looking only at this moment um, it might actually work and it does make sense in a way especially um, you can you can use different approaches oh actually what's a little easier and if you if you know duplian from longsword fencing I, I think you'll find that a li little easier we'll have a bind in quart That'll make the, the drill a little easier. Uh, and instead of disengaging, because uh, you have to find the right tempo here, um, if he tries to thrust into the quad here, what I do basically now is evade here and keeping that bind by turning the hand around and thrusting him to the opening. Okay, I think that'll be a little easier to uh, execute because it's more closely um, in resemblance to Auswinden, Duplian, and, and all those. You okay. my blade, and I actually capture the blade, but that's not a point uh, because we must be ready to receive superficial wounds <laughs> while killing the other guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the the, the, fir the first uh, version, the disengage version, um, sometimes look, looks like this. Um, yeah. He he tries to bind and stab, okay. right? I disengage and maybe even go below. Yeah. So it's, it's less of a necessity to bind, but again, more the idea of just voiding the attack and finding their targets while they move. So, so, so the contra-tempo idea. From what I find, um, it is about control, but it's more about control of the angle, of the line and of the tempo than necessarily of binding the blade, okay? So he will always prefer disengaging and thrusting into tempo um, to maybe, let's say, against this bind and his try to attack, uh, removing my fist from this most forward position to parry and then do something of it, okay? I know this is a little strange and I find it hard to accept myself, but uh, that's the argument he's making, okay? To just find the good evasive angle and uh, actually what he says here is in this case a curve is better than the straight line okay a straight line is longest is fastest and hits best but against a straight line a curve might be better okay okay so again uh, to try this uh, again we look at uh, the evasion okay you thrust to my shoulder neck whatever and my evasive movement is this okay and i can go below or if we start from a bind in, in force i can evade and thrust across here don't worry too much about binding his blade okay even if it in the end looks like this that's not a problem you can cover your neck here should his blade return towards your head you're like covered by your hand except superficial wounds okay and kill the guy okay any questions have fun then <laughs> um, that was uh, a question at several points now um, so sticking to his principal ideas your shoulder, leading shoulder, 
and uh, your point should be as far towards the opponent as you can, right? As you can reach. And uh, if we look at the plates, his feet don't turn away from the fight, but they are always turning towards the opponent, like my chest and my, my, uh, the direction of my feet is focused towards the fight. So if I cross step, I don't go here, withdrawing length and uh, turning away from the opponent, but instead I cross step like this and giving him my shoulder on top of my knee, I still uh, keep that maximum reach. Uh, so my voiding movement, it, it does look like he's turning away because he's turning the head away, right? And if I do this, it, if you look at it superficially, it seems like I would actually twist my body entirely out of the fight, but that's not the case. Uh, he just voids the uh, squishy parts and, and goes offline to find a good spot and, and hit. And we had certain, um, like uh, impressions of, oh wow, that actually works. Especially um, if I consider having a dagger, right? And then suddenly, if you would be so nice, uh, just give me a right hand thrust. <laughs> um, if you realize that by, give me a thrust, that by voiding here, uh, if I had a dagger, I could even, even better control this. I, I don't have to worry about this bind, right? I can actually just cross step and thrust into his opening without actually having to worry about anything happening from this. And if I go below, like uh, the, the other um, option we discussed, uh, he, he wants to thrust across and I just void here and go below and I stick to his principles and use first guard to thrust in there, I'm actually blocking any kind of line that could uh, come from him. Okay? Questions? Okay, so I think we're drawing to a close. I had one thing that I wanted to show you and that is, does Agrippa not parry at all? It's a just question in context of what we uh, discussed so far, right? He does, but he tries to avoid it. So another thing he discusses for the supremacy of the first guard is um, if they try and cut your arm, what to do. So if I'm in first guard and they try and cut my arm or hand, uh, normally what I want to do, can you do it again? Um, I just turn my wrist and stab him to death, right? And if he tries to cut from the outside, uh, obviously, yeah, if, if that's the, the case, I just turn my wrist into second and, and stab him, okay? But what if from a long reach, he kind of um, steps in and cuts into my guard and I can't really find the right moment of turning and contra tempo stabbing him? Well, then it's just to parry, okay? And what he does is basically, he says, no, uh, give, give me a, a top cut. He says, just lower your body. So it's not withdrawing the hand or anything, but just lower your body and drop your point. Okay, so I'm in first, he tries to cut in that, and I'll just lower my body and drop the point. So I catch his cut, and then I can go in and stab him. Okay, so yes, the idea of parrying exists, but again, he tries to find the, the optimum uh, like solution without losing any of this threat that I always want to focus on him, okay? If you will, uh, that would be the last practice for this workshop. Just uh, cut in different angles and try to find, can you oppose it in contra tempo? So, if I'm in first and he just cuts in any way and I can find, I can just turn into fourth or I can turn into second and always just, oh, I'm already lunging again, right? <laughs> just uh, stepping in and thrusting him, uh, then that's fine. And if you find, no, that's, for example, if he cuts across, uh, just give me a, a, um, 
vertical cut. If he cuts, a, uh, cuts across your first here, and there's a danger of him breaking into it, okay? That would be the classical scenario for, okay, just lower your body, drop the point, and before he can go any, anywhere with that, then uh, go and thrust him. Questions? Okay, last drill, have fun. Oops. Are we extended a little bit into the break part of the day? Uh, but I hope that's okay with you. Uh, that's not all that Agrippa has to say, obviously. It's just a few examples of the idea of um, giving the fencing teacher a new way of doing things. And that's the idea of a renaissance actually taking place in fencing even if not in regard to the fighting itself, but in regard to the didactic approach. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this. I did. Thank you. Have fun.